Good morning, everyone. Please take your Bibles, open up to Psalm chapter 2. Uh, Jacob and the band. Thank you. It was beautiful this morning. Really enjoyed it. Um, really enjoyed that time of worship. Um, I'm so grateful for the gifts that you guys have and for sharing those with us. It was so cool to see the entire uh, full band up here. It sounded so good. And you guys sounded really good as well. I can, since I'm on the front row, I can hear you guys singing, and it's such a blessing. And I also want to note, did you, did you notice the ninja this morning? Colton, if you, you may have not even have seen it. Colton changed batteries like that. He hopped up here, changed batteries, and ran back there, and you may not have even seen it. He worked like a ninja this morning. Um, but yeah, to you guys in the back, thank you for all the thankless work that you do and back there. Um, even sometimes it's sprinting up here, being a ninja, replacing batteries the split second before a song starts. That was awesome. What a good day. All right. Today's the first Sunday in Advent, um, and I almost always do this, this Christmas series called Christ in the Carols. And usually what I do is I will go back and we'll look at some of the, the hymns that we sing, the Christmas hymns that we sing, or maybe it's a, a newer song that someone's written. And we'll look at the song and what it says about Jesus, and we'll try to explain what that means to us today. Um, I'm not going to do that this year. <laughs> I'm going to do something a little bit different. I felt led to go back and look at Messianic Psalms. So there are some of the psalms in the Psalter that were, they're what we call messianic. They are the songs that they would sing in anticipation of the coming Messiah. And so I picked out certain messianic psalms that the Israelites would sing in anticipation of the Messiah uh, that we're going to look at and look at different attributes, different titles, different explanations of the Messiah within those psalms so that we can hopefully figure out what the Messiah means for us today. And today what we're looking at is Christ, or the Messiah being labeled the Messiah. What does Messiah mean? And my sermon title is Christ the Messiah, which, yes, it is redundant, but that's what it is, and we're going with it. Christ the Messiah. I want to talk about Christ being the Messiah today, and I think this is really important because we are forgetful. Why would we talk about Christmas, Advent, and Christ being the Messiah once again? Well, it's because we're forgetful. This happens frequently in the Schindler household. Lindsay and I will have a conversation. I am there, and I am present. I'm actually engaged in this conversation, talking to her about whatever it is we're talking about, Two weeks, one week, two weeks goes past, and she recalls that conversation, and we've probably made plans in that initial conversation, and she recalls that conversation and says, oh yeah, by the way, a Friday night, this is happening, and she sees the look. And she's not in here to testify to this, but every other husband can. <laughs> she sees the look, and she says to me, you don't know what I'm talking about, do you? And I have to say, nope. I don't, I don't, I don't remember, but I love you, <laughs> and because I love you so much, what I feel like we should do right now is we should rehearse that conversation, <laughs> because the more that we rehearse these things, the deeper it, it gets into my heart, where I love you, so let's, let's take it from the top, let's go one more time through that story, will you tell it to me one more time? Because I love you, I want to really remember it better than last time. And, and the truth is, I think we're all that way. Why do we need to tell the story one more time? Because we're forgetful. And the more that we retell the story of Jesus, the deeper and deeper it gets into your heart. And you love him, right? We want to know him, and so we want to tell the story again so that he, this, it gets into our minds in a deeper place. It gets into our hearts in a deeper place. And so we want to explore Jesus as the Messiah by rehearsing Christmas once again. 
And that's my main idea today is just really we want to talk about Jesus as the Messiah. Messiah. I want you to know him as the Messiah. So let's read Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2. Why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together. So the kings, the rulers are plotting for war. Who are they plotting against? Against the Lord and against his anointed one. And so these rulers say, let us break their chains. We want to be broken free from God, they cry. Let's free ourselves from slavery to God. But the one who rules in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then in anger he rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem on my holy mountain. And now that king talks. The king proclaims the Lord decrees. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Only ask and I will give the nations as your inheritance, the whole earth as your possession. You will break them with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. Now then, you kings, now that I've installed my, my king, act wisely. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverent fear and rejoice with trembling. Submit to God's holy royal son or he will become angry, and you will be destroyed in the midst of all your activities. For his anger flares up in an instant, but what joy for all who take refuge in him and God's Son. All right, what I want to do today is just ask two questions of this text. The first one is, what is the Messiah? What does Messiah mean? And then, what, why do we need a Messiah? So the first question, what does Messiah mean? We're going to begin with a working definition here that's going to be on the screen. It's this one here. It's God's anointed son sent to save, heal, and forgive. When we say Messiah, what do we mean? We mean God's anointed son sent to save, heal, and forgive. And we see him in Psalm 2. In verse 2, you see this, this word, his anointed one. So what does Messiah mean? What it means, literally, is anointed one. In the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed. And so that word there against his anointed one, that word that is, is in the Hebrew, Mashiach. It's Messiah. What does Messiah mean? One who's anointed. But we also see in Psalm 2 that this anointed one is a king. See that in verse 6. God says, I've placed my chosen king. The anointed one is God's king that he's placed in charge. So he's anointed, he's a king, but he's also God's son. So what does Messiah mean? He is anointed, he is a king, and he is God's son there in verse 6. You've said to me today, you are my son. And so in the Old Testament, this idea begins to develop that there's going to be a Messiah, a sent one, who is going to be from the line of David. He's going to be a king like David. And when this Messiah comes, what he's going to do is he's going to rule over Israel. And with that, he's going to protect Israel, which means defeating Israel's enemies. So this king, the sent one, anointed one, is going to protect Israel. But what he's also going to do is he is going to restore and rebuild the temple. And so the Old Testament is hoping waiting, anticipating for this one to come. And they have to wait a long, long time. Over 400 years, over 500 years, over 600 years, just waiting, longing, waiting for God's anointed one to come. But what we believe is that he did come, and the man, Jesus from Nazareth. And we claim that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one that Psalm 2 is talking about. That the Messiah came in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So Advent. Why are we celebrating Advent? We don't actually have to celebrate Advent, but we are. We're going to celebrate it. Why do we do this? 
Advent means coming or arrival. Um, it has to do with the coming. When we say Advent arrival in, or Advent in here, what we're talking about is the coming of the Messiah. That's what we mean. Um, Advent also refers to the four weeks leading up to Christmas. So there's, today's the first one, there'll be three more, and then Christmas comes. So there's a season in the church calendar for us to kind of prepare and anticipate the coming of Christmas. Now, I like this. I like being able to talk about Advent in the church calendar because it gives me, as your pastor, another way to teach you the life of Christ. When we look at the church calendar, I get to teach you theology, which I like doing. And I think it's important for us from time to time to stop, to pause, and to think really deeply about the life of Christ, which in the Greek, Christ means Messiah. It's, it's the Greek translation of Messiah, Mashiach. And so when we say Jesus is the Christ, we're talking about Jesus the Messiah. That's a title. It's not his last name. Jesus Christ. We're making a claim. And, but this, the church calendar gives us a chance to be able to explain and talk about and to think deeply about the life of Christ. And I think this is really important for us as Christians, right? We're Christians. We should know something about the life of Christ. Now, we're all from Hannibal as well, or near Hannibal, which means you're going to get the question from now on and again, what about that Mark Twain guy? All right? And so if you're from Hannibal, if you're a Hannibalian, you should probably know something about Mark Twain, because you're going to get the question, have you not? And so you should be able to say, well, yeah, he, I, I know a few things. He was born in 1835, which, by the way, makes him a, a contemporary of Lottie Moon. He was five years before, born five years before she was. So 1835, he was born. Where, where was he born? Good job. Florida, Missouri. It's a trick question. Everybody thinks he's born here. He was raised in Hannibal. He was born in Florida. I've seen it. I've seen it. We went with the senior adults and we saw his home where they moved his home into this shrine. <laughs> if you've been there, it's a religious experience. They, they've, <laughs> they, have, they have built a, a, a shrine around his childhood home, which is this tiny home, and you can go walk around his home. But you should probably know, you should probably know something about Mark Twain, since you're from here, but you're a Christian. I think you should know something about the life of Christ and the work of Christ. And if you can know some things about Mark Twain, I think you can also know some things about Christ. So what I want to do is I want to cover the life, the work, the saving work of the Messiah in five stages. When we say Messiah, we're talking about him working to save, to seek, and to save the lost in five stages. Stage number one, incarnation. Merry Christmas. When we say incarnation, and every one of these have a correlation to the church calendar. So when we say incarnation, we're talking about the second person of the Trinity, the, the God who's, who's the Son becoming human, taking on human flesh, becoming weak like we are, the one who has all power and authority becoming like us, identifying with us. We're talking about the Word of God taking on flesh, that's what incarnate means. It means for the Word of God to take on flesh. God, to take on flesh, become weak and become a baby boy born in a manger. That's what we mean by incarnation. That's the first stage in the work of the Messiah. Stage number two in the work of the Messiah is his death. Which, by the way, with incarnation, that's, when, what's a, that's what we're celebrating on Christmas Day. Right? Advent is a time to prepare for that, to think about our condition and the anticipation, waiting for the incarnation of the Messiah. But the second stage is his death. So included in the incarnation is his life and his ministry. But what we remember in that Passion Week, remember as we get closer to Easter, there will be a Passion Week where we celebrate Good Friday, Jesus' crucifixion, and we remember Holy Saturday when he is buried, laid in a tomb like a seed laid in the ground. He's, he dies, but that leads us to the third stage in the work of the Messiah, which is resurrection. So Merry Christmas, Happy Easter. 
Three days after he was crucified, God raised him up from the dead. And then after that, and Rich referenced this, after that, he ascended into heaven. So, but there was a period of 40 days. So after his resurrection, the Bible says there were 40 days that he spent on earth teaching his disciples, interacting with his disciples, explaining, I'm going to go. And after 40 days, he ascended to the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And there is a date on the church calendar for that. All you do is you go to Easter Sunday and you count out 40 days, and then you land on a Tuesday all the time because Easter's always on a Sunday. 40 days later, it's a Tuesday, which is Ascension Day, where we remember the fourth stage of the work of the Messiah, where he ascended to God's right hand, where he currently rules and reigns over all things. And all of those four works, those stages of the work of the Messiah, have correlations to how we worship throughout the year. The fifth stage, however, is his return. It's his second advent when he comes back. And the whole world knows then that he has always been reigning, and every knee bows, every tongue confesses that he indeed is Lord. And the church, you today find yourself in between four and five. Who are we? We are people of the Messiah. We have put our faith in the first four stages of the work of the Messiah. And we say, yes, indeed, Jesus of Nazareth, he did that work, and he is our Messiah. We are Messiah people. We're being shaped and formed into the body of the Messiah, the church. And we are a witness to this Messiah, to a, de a, de a dead and dying world. All right, and that's what, that's what we're doing. And we're also anticipating, waiting for his return, his second advent. So these five stages of the work of the Messiah, as the disciples and as the, er, as the New Testament authors looked at the, at the work of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, as he was working out these works, what they decided, because he did these things, they said, he is the Messiah. It was the proof that he was the Messiah. And because he is Israel's Messiah, hear this, he can be your Messiah. Merry Christmas. And what this means is, it says there in verse 12, but what joy for those who take refuge in him. If you put your faith in the Messiah, what you'll find this Christmas is true joy. Amen. So that's what Messiah means. Now, why do we need a Messiah? That's my second question for today. Why do we need a Messiah? Well, first of all, we find ourselves here in God's good creation. Right? This is, where, where are we? You're right here in God's good creation. So in, in Psalm chapter 2, he refers to there's rulers, there are nations, there are people. It talks about the earth. Where do all those things come from? Right? Where do, where, do, where do people, where do nations, where do all these things come from? They come from God, right? He created you. Why are, why, have you thought about this for a while? Why are you here instead of not here? Why are you, like, really, why are you here instead of not here? Why do you exist? And what the Bible says is God is the one who created you. He created you, and he created you to be in relationship with him. So where are you? Who are you? You are created by God here in his good creation, but there's a problem. Humanity has a major, major problem. It's a sin condition. So we're here in God's good creation, but we have this major sin condition, and we see it fleshed out there in Psalm 2. And it's fleshed out in, in these rulers. Do you remember what they're doing? The rulers, these kings, they rebel against God. These rulers, they decide, you know what, our worldview is this. God is... He is so enslaving, right? God, God is this cosmic killjoy, and all he does is he rules over us and just takes away all of our fun, and I want to do this, I want to do this, and he says no, and, and so they have this worldview that God is just trying to make my life miserable, and instead they say, you know what, 
I, I just want to be done with God. He's just, I, he's, I'm, I'm just chained up when I'm with God, and so I want to be set free. And really what those rulers are saying is, I want to be my own God. I want to rule my own life. I don't need God to rule over me. I want to be my own ruler. And so they rebel against God with this ungodly worldview. And then they also, it says, that they rebel against his anointed one. They don't just rebel against God. They're rebelling against his Messiah and his ways. And then in verse 12, there's, there's a warning. This sinful behavior, there's a warning. It's the wrath of God. There is eternal punishment because God is a holy God. He is holy, completely holy, and sin cannot be in his presence. And so for those who rebel against God and reject him and go their own way, that's sin, and there's an eternal physical punishment for sin in a place called hell. Why do we need a Messiah? You are lost, you are sick, and you are cursed with sin. And there's nothing that you can do to s fix this problem. You can't solve the problem. You can't save yourself. There's this void in your life that you can't fill up on your own. Um, the world likes to think that we're, you know, we're good people. We just have a few bad days, you know, but we're, we're good people with bad moments. But what the Bible says is, no, 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 we are bad people. And even when we try to do good, it's no good. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things. It's desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad the heart is. And so, I, you know, how, how, so how do we find true happiness? I, I, I preached about this a couple weeks ago, and, or I mentioned it, and I said, the world, the world kind of does it this way. The world tries to look inwardly, and I said that doesn't work. And I, I checked, I checked this week. I had, nothing's changed in the last two weeks. The world's still trying to find happiness the same way. And so I Googled it, and I, just, I was just kind of curious. I think I, I knew what I was going to find, but I just Googled. I asked Google instead of God, Google, how to find true happiness. And, and like the first website I, I found, here, here's what they said. They said, if you want to find true happiness, true joy, here's what you need to do. Practice looking inwards. Build, your, build up your self-esteem and take time to appreciate yourself. Did you, did you notice the theme there? Just look inward. Just, I mean, if you want to find true happiness, just look in. Just build yourself up. Just keep, just look inward, build up your self-esteem, then you'll find, then you'll make yourself happy. But what would you, what would you say about our, our situation? You're lost. You're sick. Inside of you is just a big old void without Christ. And so if you just, if you just try to find happiness inwardly, you're not going to find it. And so this Christmas, this Advent, what I want to challenge you to do is not look inward to try to find happiness and joy. Look outward. Now, I've got to be careful here. Looking outward, you know, the devil's got his way to manipulate this as well. So when I say look outward, I'm not talking about consumerism, and I'm not talking about competition. All right, okay, so I've got this void in my heart. All right, looking inward doesn't work, Pastor says, so I'm going to look out. I'm going to go buy products. I'm going to go buy stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill up my house with stuff, and hopefully that'll fill up the void that I have. I'm just going to buy some products. Or I'm going to find my joy, my peace, my, what I need in competition. I'm going to work, and I'm going to strive for prizes, whether it's at work. I'm going to become the best employee that I can be. Um, I'm going to win all the prizes, or it's going to be in my sport. I'm going to compete to the best of my ability and to get those prizes. And what everybody will tell you who has achieved to the highest level, those prizes, they do not fill that void. They still leave you feeling empty. And so when I say look out, I'm not talking about products. I'm not talking about prizes. I'm talking about a person. I'm talking about Jesus from Nazareth, who we claim is Jesus the Christ. He's the one that you need, as the Bible says, but what joy for all who take refuge in him, in God's Messiah, Christ the Lord. Why do we need a Messiah? 
because we need him to save us. And this is, we need, we need someone to offer us redemption as a gift, which is what Jesus does. See, God knows your human condition. He knows where you're at. He knows how sick and lost and the void in your heart. He knows it. And he knows it so well that he gave up his position, everything that he had in heaven. And he became like you. He became weak like you. He came to meet you in your pain and in your suffering. And not just meet you there, he came to take on your weakness. He came to take on your sin. He said, put that on me. I will bear that for you. He came, he had to become, because he's God, there had to be incarnation. He had to become like us, to become weak and to take on our sin, but he was also holy, he was perfect. And so he takes on our sin and he doesn't just become like us, he dies in our place. We are the ones who were sinful and we rebelled against God and he says, I will take your place. I will die in your place. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. What do we remember and rehearse during Advent and during Christmas is that Jesus saves sinners and he restores humanity into a right relationship with God. All right. Now, every time that I get to teach theology, every time we teach theology here, or you hear a preacher preach, or if you hear a Sunday school teacher teach, or if you hear a, a parent teaching you things about Jesus, when, you, when we teach theology, certain things happen. All right, we've just rehearsed the life of Christ. Certain things happen when this uh, is preached and you hear it once again. One of the things that can happen is that your faith can be reinforced. That's a good thing. And so I hope today your faith has been reinforced. You know what I mean? It's strengthened. Some of you came in here saying yes and amen to this sermon. I believe that. And I say yes and amen to you. So here's what I want you to do. Remember that you live in between the fourth and the fifth stage of the work of the Messiah. You are one of the Messiah's people. And he has called you to live your life in faith to the Messiah living your life in accordance with the Messiah, and he's called you to be a witness to the Messiah, to Christ. And so as you go out this week with your faith reinforced and strengthened, and as you meet your coworkers, your family, share the story. Invite them to come to church. I'm going to be rehearsing the story. Remember, I'm a little forgetful. We're going to have to rehearse it for a few more weeks. I wanted to get down deep and register deep into my heart and soul. And so we're going to retell this story week after week. So invite your friends to come and hear this story. You're one of Messiah's people. This is what we do. We go witness to him. When we teach theology, so we're going to reinforce, what it also does is it can, uh, it can challenge some wrong beliefs, some wrong behaviors. And so maybe today, I mean, we're, we're all kind of a work in progress. I've got some wrong ideas about Christ that need to be straightened up. I've got some wrong behaviors that need to be straightened up. But what we do when we preach the life of Christ, when we hold up the life of Christ on a Sunday morning and throughout the church year, when we hold up the life of Christ, essentially what we're saying is, this is what true life looks like. His life is what true humanity looks like. You're not happy because you're, trying, you're not trying to be like him. He's what true humanity really looks like. And this is why Paul is convinced that we're not just... As I share this story, it's not just for you to marvel at it, to be like, oh, thank you. I, I'm so grateful for what Christ has done. I'm so grateful for his example, his incarnation, his death, his resurrection. I'm, I'm so thankful and I marvel at him. But what he's calling you to do is to mimic him. Not just marvel, but mimic him. He, remember, the invitation that Jesus makes to his disciples, is, he says, okay, if you want to follow after me. If you want to be one of my disciples, here's what you need to do. Deny yourself. Take up what? Your cross and come and follow after me. And so when we hold up the life of Christ and I tell you his life is about incarnation and it's about dying to yourself and it's about being resurrected, that's exactly what we are supposed to do. We are the people, as the Messiah people, who went down into a watery grave in our baptism when we were 
We gave up our old self where we were self-seeking. I want to be, I want to be king. Rule my life. We died to that, and now we're living a new resurrected life where we look at the world differently. We're done with that old worldview where we don't want God to rule and reign. Now where he is ruling and reigning, and what he says is now go love your neighbors. Go love your brothers and sisters. Go be a witness to the Messiah. And so, every one of us, we're a work in progress, right? As we hold up the life of Christ this year, you may, there, there's going to be times where you realize, man, I'm not, I'm not quite there yet. And he's going to shape you. He's going to form you, and it's going to be into a very specific shape of the shape of the cross. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want right now, just, just remember, remember where God found you. Just for a moment. Remember where God found you. Remember the void. Remember the darkness. Remember the lostness that you felt. And I, for all of us who have been saved, we remember it. And so think back. Think where God found you. And think where he's brought you. Right? He's, he's been working in your life. He's been moving in your life. And he wants to continue to work in your life this Christmas. And so we're going to rehearse the story once again because it's going to challenge you and it's going to shape you and correct you in some ways where you're going to look back and say, man, he keeps working in my life. He's so faithful. He began a good work in me and he's not going to stop. And so that's what we're reminding ourselves of this year is he's a good God and he's going to keep working in us. He found me down in the ditch and he saved me and he keeps working in me. He's actually making my life, my life into something. And we're going to rehearse that story and tell that story. Um, yeah. Last thing I want to say, when we teach theology, when we teach the life of Christ, the other, so it's going to reinforce beliefs you already have. If you're a Christian, it could challenge some beliefs that you have. Here's the other thing it does. It's going to invite you into this story. If you have never believed this story, it's going to invite you in. And so today, I've told you this story. I've offered it once again as a statement of truth. I'm inviting you in to believe it, and whenever we tell this story, when the New Testament authors were inspired to write this story and offer it to you, offer it to the world, they're saying, this is true. Jesus from Nazareth is Jesus the Christ. We submit this to you as truth, and at this point, right here, right now, on this Sunday morning, you have two options. You can either acknowledge this truth and say, Jesus is the Christ, is he? Yes, indeed, I believe it. Or your other option is to contradict it. Say, Jesus is the Christ, is he? Not my life. He's not king of my life. You have those two options today, right now. We have rehearsed the story of the gospel. It's presented to you as truth. And you can either acknowledge it and say, Jesus is the Christ. Yes, he is. I want him to be Christ and Lord of my life, Messiah of my life. I'm so sick of the darkness and the void of my life. I need him to come into my heart and to save me. You're telling me that God would do this? He would come, he would leave heaven and come down to earth and to save me? He would do that for me? Yes, that's the good news of the gospel. Merry Christmas. Your other option is to say, you know what, Anthony? Nope. Jesus is the Christ, is he? No, I disagree. No, he's not. I'll just remind you what Psalm 2 said. Submit to God's royal son or he will become angry and you will become destroyed in the midst of all your activities for his anger flares up in an instant. But what joy for all who take refuge in him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, Thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for a chance to be able to rehearse the story of Christmas and Advent and the whole life of Christ, the whole life of the Messiah. And Father, as your church right now, what we do is we just declare, we believe that Jesus from Nazareth, the man that lived 2,000 years ago, he is your Christ, the one waited for, anticipated in the Old Testament. He is the one. And we want to follow him. Father, I pray that over this Christmas season, really over all of 2024, that you would shape and form your people to look more like Jesus Christ.
And for those of you here today who, with your head bowed, eyes closed, um, you would say, hey, I, I want to, I've heard this message, what do I do now? I want to just read, I want to read a verse, just listen to it. This is in Acts chapter 2. This is after the very first Christian sermon. Peter preaches a sermon, and he's saying, because of the resurrection, we believe Jesus is the Messiah, and there's people there, they're listening, and they say, they say this, or Peter ends it this way, he says, so let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, and it says, Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? So you might be here today, and these words have pierced your heart, when I said void in your heart, void in your life, you were like, I know exactly what you're talking about, Pastor. I don't have Christ, and everything I try to fill up my life with is just so meaningless. It doesn't actually bring me any joy. The prizes, the products, the, the alcohol, whatever it is I'm trying to fill up my life with, it just has no meaning. Your heart may have been pierced. And so they asked, what do we do? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? And that Holy Spirit's what fills you up, gives you joy. This promise is to you. This gift is to you, your children, and to those far away who have been called by the Lord Jesus. This message has now reached your ears, and you have a chance to accept it. If you're ready to accept it, all you have to do is tell the Lord Jesus this in a prayer. Just say, Lord, I admit to you I'm a sinner. I've rebelled against you. I was Lord of my own life, and it left me nowhere. Just with more pain and misery, no hope, no joy, no meaning, just lost darkness. But I believe that Jesus of Nazareth is Jesus the Christ, that he performed a work in his incarnation, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension that provides for me salvation. I want to believe in him. I want to commit my life to him. And I'm telling you, if you said that prayer today and you meant it in your heart, God steps out out of heaven and he steps into your heart and he's now king and ruler of your life. He saved you. And I know what you'll find is true meaning and peace and joy. Why don't you stand up on your feet with us? We're going to sing a song of invitation. And if you uh, made a decision today to follow Christ, I'd like to know about it. You can do that in a couple of ways. One way is right now. We're going to sing the song of invitation. I invite you to come and tell me about a decision that you made. I'll tell you about other ways you can let me know at the end. But um, at this time, if you, if you need to make a decision public, I'll be here to receive you. If you, to, if you want to join this church, if God's working in your heart, tell, calling you into ministry, calling you into missions, if you just need to come and pray, feel free. We'll, we'll just spend some time here in, in response and invitation. But if you need to come and talk to me, I invite you to do that today.